God has something to say to anyone who complains. It's not fair. Every time I look, evil doers are going unpunished. Hi, I'm Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida, and I invite you to our worship at 830 and 1030. You can find us at the corner of Lake Ida and Swinton in Delray Beach, and we invite you also to come to this Bible study every Sunday at 930 in the morning. So you are welcome here. Let's get started to we may not finish today, but today and um, next time, we'll finish Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. We are in chapter 3, and I invite you, even though we have the Bible verses on screen most of the time, I invite you always to bring your own Bible along and look up things uh, that may not be on the screen, or follow your own tangents. This is the question before us, and it's, it's an important question. It is one of the questions that we get asked more often than any other. It's in the top 10. If God is just, why is life so unfair? Why is life uh, full of problems? And uh, why do we have many problems, you know? I don't know what it is. And... Uh, so here's the question. Today's people are similar to the people of the 5th century before Christ. In this respect, they complained. <laughs> they complained. Since evildoers go unpunished, there's no benefit in living righteous lives. I hope you've never said or even thought that, but maybe you have. What's the benefit of obeying God if those who don't obey never get punished for it. It's not fair. Every teenager says to his parents, it's not fair. It's not fair. And um, we are caught in a dilemma between those things which are absolutely right and those things which others have made to be right. You get the question? Mm -hmm. Okay, the difference between God's law and man's law. It's not fair. Well, let's uh, tackle that problem that all of us have from time to time. In the book of Malachi, named after the prophet, God is speaking. Behold, I send my messenger. And last time we considered this brief outline of the third chapter of Malachi. God says, I call my people to repent of robbing me and to receive my abundant blessings. We covered that last time. Today, two more points on the outline. God says, I call my people not to speak against my will. Not to speak against my will. And I call my people to believe my promise. I will keep them that is, those who remain faithful, as my treasured possession. Because the end of it all, and I mean the end, of all of this life on planet Earth that we are enjoying today, one day will come to an end. And in that moment, we will see that God has kept his promise. You are my treasured possession, and I take you to myself. That's a hard thing to imagine, but it's coming one fine day. In the meantime, we have to live in this world of unfairness. The Lord wants the people not to speak against his will. Um, I'm not going to start with Judy for a change. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with Jamie. Would you read uh, chapter 3, verses 12 to 15? Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, but you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. 
Yeah, that's a way of stating the complaint. There is an unusual expression here. What's the profit our, of our keeping his charge? Keeping God's charge means obeying what he has charged us to do. And walking as in mourning, we're going to cover in a little bit, so I won't, I won't say what it is now. Maybe you can guess, has nothing to do with mourning the death of, of someone. I want you to notice this dialogue. Remember, there are at least eight, maybe 13 times in this short book when there's a dialogue between God and the people. I want you to carefully, in silence, silently read with your eyes and your heart, uh, read the passage again. Okay, you got it? So what is the question I have there at the bottom of the screen? Can you read it? What is their issue against God? Yeah. I, I think they want a judgment and it, it's God's judgment, not theirs. They want God to judge the evildoers Mm -hmm. and the arrogant the arrogant are those who seem to get away with murder as the expression goes and maybe it sometimes you know if you work in the justice department of any any level of government you have to have a, a, a stomach for this constant battle of not always getting the bad guy if you watch any TV dramas that have to do with law and order, not necessarily that program, you realize how difficult it is to find the guilty guilty. Right? All right. I'm not going to discuss that in any governmental or political way because God has given us the government in order to bring order. <laughs> but it doesn't always work as we have seen in the last year or two or three. So I have some questions before you. I think there are three or four. The first is the people speak against the Lord and his will for them. And they say, it's, it's vain to serve God. What is the profit? What do we get for being good do-gooders? Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test. If you read some of the Psalms, like Psalm 14, it is uh, an expression that comes something like this. Um, the psalmist is writing words that the evildoers might speak. And the evildoers are saying, oh, it won't matter. God doesn't see us. Isn't that arrogance? Since God sees and knows all. It is. Oh, pardon? I said it is, yes. But the fact that they actually use the word God is, is something. Well, uh, people use the God in, God in a, an unbelieving way and a, yes. in a way that says, I don't, I'm not saying I trust him. I know there is a God. And some say there is no God, but they still have a conscience, which yes. is bearing witness to the fact that there is a God who gave them a conscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, that's in Romans chapter one. It's like the atheists that are always trying to, um, uh, um, they're trying to have people not believe in God. So you know they must know there's something out there because otherwise they wouldn't be working so hard to disprove God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't have to disprove something that isn't there. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, they're trapped in their own thing. And that's what St. Paul says in Romans 1. They have no excuse. So what's the profit of our walking as in mourning before the Lord? When would the Lord ever want the people to walk in mourning? Yeah. 
when they are repenting of their sins. That's it. What's the profit of our going about in mourning, like putting on sackcloth and ashes? I don't think any of you have ever put on sackcloth. <laughs> but uh, uh, two or 3,000 years ago, that was a symbol of going in mourning. Now we just wear black. No, when you come to church on Sunday, you do not wear black as some people in some denominations might have done 100 years ago to show that they were in mourning over their what? Sins, transgressions. Right. Yeah. Right. So what is the profit of our, we would say today, what is the profit of our coming and confessing our sins? Because the evil that is in the world is just going to happen anyway. Why should I tell God I have sinned? You see, you see what they're putting before God? They're just putting this in his, in his face. Pastor, I, I might have, you know, been uh, still on the turnip truck, but um, <laughs> um, I didn't know that people went to church in black because of their sins. I thought it was because they lost someone dear to them. Oh, that is a true mourning over a loss. I'm yeah. talking about someone who would put on black in order to show I am a sinner and I wear black. I that they did that. Yeah. It, not yeah. not in denominations that you would see today. Oh. Okay. Now, uh, here's Malachi 3.15. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. So my question is this. Those who speak against the Lord are prone to say it's not fair. And the it in their sentence really means God is not fair. God is not just. He has skewed the balance scales against me. And I'm always suffering, even though I do right, and all the evildoers escape. Yeah. So how does verse 15 voice this complaint? I think it's obvious. That's yeah. very... Well, the evildoers are, are prospering on top of it. Can you give an example, uh, even if you have to make one up, and I hope you do, because I hope you don't know anyone like that. Make up an example that shows... Uh, what verse 15 is, or from the headlines. Well, I would say uh, those people who uh, ask people to invest in their Ponzi schemes and they profit, but the people lose. That's... Right. Everybody remembers Bernie Madoff. Yeah. yeah which is a pun you couldn't make up, but it's there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it happens. Uh, people are against the banks. Well, so there are, there are some, there are some, uh, I want to go back to some of the old TV evangelists mm -hmm. um, prospered uh, by money, people sending money into them and all that sort of thing and uh, live very, very prosperous. Or even some of the organizations that are out there today, people are giving to the organization, but the money is not going to the real cause. Unfortunately, it's being skimmed at the top. Okay. Yeah, that's why you want to investigate before you mm -hmm. invest or before you give to a charity. Correct. Right. Well, it's not fair. <laughs> and another question. How common is this today? Pretty common. Yeah. How, would you, how would you respond if you heard someone, you're talking with a neighbor or a friend over coffee or dinner or just across the back fence or after church on Sunday? How would you respond if you heard this complaint? This, I'm, I'm doing good and the evildoers are getting away with it all. How would you respond? 
well, God has a plan and we don't know that plan and they might get theirs later on. Okay. We still have to continue to do what we know is right. And not use that as an excuse for joining them in their okay. evil. Why is it that so many of those who do evil seem to prosper? I said seem to prosper in this world. That's, that's the way the devil operates, unfortunately, in the world. That's because it's a materialistic world. We are materialistic. Yeah. We want. Sometimes the response is none at all. Nothing is, nothing is said at all. Mm -hmm. It's just, um, it's just kind of passed over your shoulder and hopes you hope it'll go away. I guess, but it doesn't, unfortunately. It doesn't. Does someone have music in the background? That... Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, my father's watching TV in the other room. Okay. I can mute myself. Well, you okay. can if, if, if that helps, yeah. I know we all have background. And I'm glad that you're there for your dad. That's not a problem. A few centuries ago, there was a man named Asaph. Do you remember who Asaph was? Mm -mm. Really, but yes. Anybody? Aesop's Fables? That's all I remember. No, no, not that guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a good, good answer. No, it isn't. <laughs> uh, and the reason you don't remember Asaph is you do not generally read the superscription to the Psalms when you read the Psalms. Oh. At the heading of every psalm is, uh, at sometimes, not every time, but some, many of, uh, most of the 150 psalms have the author up there, and they're not all David, you know that. David, about 100, of the 150, about 75. Okay. And the next most common author to the Psalms is Asaph. So he had the same complaint. And I want to take this intentional tangent <laughs> to read a Psalm that someone gave to me decades ago when I said, it's not fair. <laughs> it's not fair. Psalm 73, verse 3. Judy. Okay, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. I think we've all been there. Mm -hmm. Asaph wrote that. And Judy, would you continue? Okay, Psalm uh, 73, 12 to 17. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. What is he talking about there? What's his complaint? I think he says, if he had been complaining, if I would, if I will speak thus ah. that thing before, that he he would have betrayed generations of your children. All right. If you see verse fifteen as the turning point in the psalm, which it is. Okay, I want to cover up. I can't do it. <laughs> I want to cover up verse fifteen. Now I'll ask my question again, even though. You're correct. You're correct in noticing if I had said. <laughs> I shouldn't have put that up there. What's his complaint in 12 through 14? About the world. Yeah. Does they're, it they're getting they're getting ahead? Well, here I am trying to keep all the commandments and I'm doing good. And yeah. Um, 
you know, it's this doesn't seem like I'm getting anywhere for doing it. What does that sound like? <laughs> envy. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to envy the wicked. That doesn't make sense to the Christian. But it doesn't it sound like what the people in Malachi's day were saying? Certainly. Yeah. Uh -huh. You see the parallel? Now, mm -hmm. I wonder, have these people uh, of Malachi's day ever read Psalm 73? Mm -hmm. I don't know. If they had, they had forgotten it. That's the problem that we have is we read scripture and three months later, we can't remember anything about reading that passage. And I want to commend to you uh, the reading of the entire Psalm. It's, it's rather long, uh, you know, medium long. And um, it voices this complaint. But this, um, this man who told me when I said it's not fair, he just told me to read Psalm 37 and 73. And once you uh, play the little game with the numbers 73 and 37, and they're on the same subject, you never forget it. And then when you're in the ministry and you realize this is a partial answer to those who say it's not fair, you dwell on it and you know it's there and it's a touchstone. It's a place to go when you feel like, uh, why do I even try? Okay. So I want to put up another verse, Judy, for you to read. 16 and 17, please. Oh, okay. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Hmm. Ah. Mm -hmm. I it's, let it go. Yeah, that's a good way to, to deal with it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And put yourself in the sanctuary of God. Now, what in the world? is the connection between Asaph going into God's sanctuary and then said, oh, I know what's going to happen. What's going to happen? Oh, going to the sanctuary. Okay. Judy, Jamie? Well, then... You know, if you go, he discerned their end. I mean, of course, they would not be going to heaven. They would be going to hell. Yeah, that little word end. <laughs> the little word end speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. If you did not, if you considered yourself a Christian, but never went to worship, never learned the word of God, never contemplated the end of all things and judgment day you, you would just not know that that justice might be delayed yeah i i think um you're like you're saying many times in today's world when we feel things are unjust we have to turn it over to christ and say you know it's not for me to judge there'll come that day when christ is going to judge the fairness of this right. world okay and you can leave it to god yes you have to turn it over to him to do the, to be the judge not you to try to judge it and on the other side of the coin you can say look what i have because of christ because i have not kept my heart clean i have not always had innocent hands i have been i needed the lord to strike me and rebuke me. Understand that we have been forgiven much. Oh, yes, we have been forgiven much. And I would have you look at the fact that Christ has taken your end, I'm using that word, and he has taken your end and suffered it. So, the end that the evildoers, those who never repent and do not trust the Lord for their salvation, have no Christ, 
That's it. Okay. God is just. Now, I know in the legal circles, there is a saying, uh, justice de delayed is justice denied. Hmm. You've ever heard that? Yeah. But, hmm. Justice delayed is justice denied. Well, we have uh, even a constitutional amendment that guarantees the right to a speedy trial. Depends on how many appeals your attorney makes. I hope you're never in that position. But you see, the idea is, is to get on with it and not suffer endless years of prison before your case is adjudicated. Watching too many TV shows, I know. Well, that's where we are today. Now let's go on and finish a part of Psalm 73. Can I ask you a quick question? You said 30, Psalm 37, and, and of course we're reading 73, are about complaints. But 37 times 2 is 74. Did you, you make that reference that it was 37 times 2 or... You know, I just said that, um, I don't know, I, I can do this. I think I have it. Where is it? Well, uh, you know, I'll take your tangent. You know, sometimes I wish we were in the upper room, <laughs> the copper, the conference room, not Jesus' upper room. That's done. Okay. <laughs> now, are, do you see this on the screen? Yes. Yeah, your Bible gateway. Okay. Fret, you're not, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like grass and wither like green herb. So the answer is given right away in the first two verses. Right. Okay. And verse 7, be still before the Lord and we wait patiently for him. Wow. I'll uh, make it larger. You see it okay? Yeah. That's good. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. You see it's the same theme? Yes. And put away your anger. Refrain from anger. Fret not yourself. <laughs> I knew a couple years ago, and uh, when, when there was a complaint, uh, they would say, to each other or to me, fret not. Mm -hmm. Fret not. Now the word fret has fallen into dis disuse. <laughs> Someone wanted to find fret for me, F-R-E-T. That's not the place on the guitar. That's a different. Fret. Mm. Uh, to be upset, um, upset. Yeah, upset especially. You can or, fret over evil or you can fret over something that might happen but hasn't happened and worry about it. Worry, yeah. Uh -huh. But the meek shall inherit the, the land. So there's a promise to those. The wicked plots against the righteous. I think you get the, you get the theme. Is that, uh, does that help, uh, Jamie? I mean, uh, Chris? No, no, it wasn't that. And I was going to go read it. It was that you said... Your your people told you to read thirty seven and thirty seven times two. No, no, I didn't. I didn't mean. I meant to take 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 the numerals and reverse them. I I, I misspoke. Seventy three. Uh, turn Thirty seven and seventy three. The same okay. numbers. That's all. I, yeah. As you know, my brain didn't compute. So sorry. <laughs> well, I'm glad you introduced it because that meant that others were, were probably having the the same problem. But I thank you for the, um, because that allowed us to go and look at the, the, the tangent. Yes. Psalm 37. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if you add them together, you, you get a different thing. <laughs> so, all right. But then here I'm repeating the two verses. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed like to me, it seemed to me a wearisome task. I could just go over it and over it again, and I can't solve it until I went into God's place and I saw his holiness. 
and I saw my unholiness. But I also knew that for those who do not trust in the Lord for their salvation, they have an end that is horrible beyond the word horrible. All right. They sh they should add a little a little comment on there. <laughs> we I know we're not supposed to add to the Bible, but I discerned their end, and then uh, you know, and then I received Jesus' grace <laughs> in parentheses. Right. Or something. Well, when you're reading the Psalms, you you can't see the New Testament Correct. in so many words. That's true. That's true. So what you do with your Lutheran Study Bible or whatever you have, you have something that refers you to the various yeah. verses in the Bible that Cross talk about the, right. So here where God reveals this mystery, Asaph realized there would come a day when we will see the distinction. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to talk about for a few minutes, this um, distinction between those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous. But that means that we have to talk about who are the righteous? Mm. Those are that are for, those that believe in Jesus Christ and are forgiven. Okay. Well, who are because the? We're not um, perfect. All right. The faithful. The faithful. Good. Yeah. Now, if you read Romans chapter three or chapter two leading up to chapter three, you're going to hear Paul quote the Psalms. There is no one who is righteous. No, not one. No one seeks after God. And he condemns both Jew and Gentile. There is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know that part of the Bible. So you also know that without Christ, you are not righteous. And you know that you have an alien righteous. You don't like the word alien. You don't have to use that. Okay. You have a righteousness that was not yours, and it was given to you. Right? Right. So there is a distinction between those are who are righteous in God's sight through the merits, and this is what you were getting to, Judy, through the merits of Jesus Christ, and you know that those who do not have his borrowed? No, we get it permanently. There is, uh, uh, okay, we get it from Christ. From, so it's faith. not our, ours. Go, go, go ahead, Chris. Or Jamie. I can say anything, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I said grace, through his grace. Uh, through his grace, okay. So there's a distinction. And I wanted you to understand or to remember the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous as the Bible uses those words. We will no longer complain on that day when we see the distinction. We will no longer complain. It's not fair. We will fall on our knees and worship him. We will not charge God with unrighteousness. Wow. We will say as we do today, forgive us, O Lord, for complaining about the apparent injustice of our times, the times that we lived. Hmm. And we might as well pray that prayer today, mm -hmm. that we have, if God were to list his complaints against each one of us, hmm. if thou, O Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Mm -hmm. You stand before the the bar of justice. Is that throw the first rock? Well, uh, <laughs> yes, it is. So that if I, uh, I like to, I like to, I find myself every time we go out driving, mm -hmm. I find the evil in other drivers. I can see it all. <laughs> Do you? So he didn't even stop at that stop sign. He just, <laughs> I just find the unrighteous people all over the highway. 
I, I know it was red. I could because ours was green. He, he had to be going through a red light. So as I've told you before, uh, my wife has to remind me, I am not a policeman. I'm also not a member of the Florida Department of Transportation so that I get to criticize the way they built this highway. Uh, these are silly complaints and I'm, I'm embarrassed to confess them before you, but I see injustice every day, just as you do. And I'm using this as a foolish example. I, I really, I really like that though. That that's, that's so, um, it lifts so much off your, your shoulders and conscience. What? The, the last, the last paragraph. We will oh. no longer complain. It's not fair. Yeah. Yeah. I used to get incensed by people who didn't pick up their dog poop. Especially if I walked in it, yeah. you know, because when I had a dog. But uh, yeah. someone told me uh, uh, that was years ago. But I mean, I mean, at least only ten. But that the rain will take it away, you know, or the sprinkler system, you know, if they did do that. And that kind of soothed me without knowing this song and stuff like that. But it was like, yeah, what, what are you getting so up about, you know? Yeah. But there are people really incensed. I mean, I was one of them at one time. I'm not now, thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and mine and mine is uh, trash. People that just throw trash everywhere. Oh, yeah. There's trash. Yeah. That really gets to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, three feet away from a public trash bin. Yeah, right. All right. So uh, this will kind of help us uh, live, as you say, with take a little load off your shoulders and say, you know, that's not uh, that's not yeah. mine to worry about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, who hasn't read today? I think me. Chris, you haven't read. Would you do, do this reading, please? <clears throat> Malachi three sixteen to 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possessions. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. And once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between ones who serve God and the one who does not serve him. There you go. Yeah. Now, fear the Lord is another phrase meaning the believers. This is proper fear of the Lord. And the Lord paid attention to them. Isn't that amazing? No, it isn't. We have promises all over the Bible that tell us that God hears our complaints, even if they're unjust. But he paid attention to the fact that they knew there was a difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. And we're going to talk about this book of remembrance in a bit. They esteemed his name. Uh, when I think about the Lord's Prayer, that first petition sometimes goes by without my thinking about it. Hallowed be thy name. May your name be kept holy. God's name is holy in and of itself, but we pray in this prayer that God would help us to keep his name holy. And then Luther goes on with, well, how do we do this? Uh, I should ask the new catechism student uh, who, is no, who has finished his catechism rather than uh, my <laughs> sort of sloppy quotation of the large, the small catechism. All right, Ian, you, you would probably hear the difference between the two renditions of the Lord's Prayer explanation. Let's not stay on that tangent. And then there's a promise, they shall be mine. And I'm going to be part of God's treasured possession by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he will spare us. What is, well, if, if, 
spare us, good Lord. That's in the litany for Lent that some of you read many years ago. Spare us, good Lord. Okay. And then this is the thing that I want to concentrate on. You'll see the distinction. All right, let's go on. And maybe we've got some questions to ask. And I don't want to have to take a look at the clock to see where we are. Oh, we have some time to consider these questions. By the grace of God, repentance took up residence in the hearts of those who feared the Lord. How did this repentance come about? Think of the whole book of Malachi or scripture in general. Well, there's the Old Testament way and the New Testament way, isn't there? In the Old Testament, repentance is the same as the New in that okay. we have sorrow over our sin and want to change and go about actually making the change in our hearts and in our behavior. Mm. But how would that repentance come about? Well, we talked about earlier in Malachi where they were um, mm. giving um, diseased animals and that for their offerings, for re which was done for repentance. And I would think now that they have, uh, now they would certainly fear the Lord and they would properly do those uh, sacrifices with, with uh, firstborn lambs that were pure and uh, free of disease or whatever the animal was that they were supposed to bring. Exactly, yeah. But so I'm asking, answer, go ahead, Chris. Was, was the sacrifices and then Jesus' sacrifice. That's what I meant by the old and the new. Well, in the Old Testament, they were, they were saved by their confidence that the Lord would bring about exactly. his own sacrifice. And these animals were only prefiguring the great and perfect sacrifice right. that the New Testament reveals. So right. there really isn't any different, but I'm asking a different question. How? How did it happen that the people would repent? Oh. What changed them? What changes you? Well, teaching, teaching and educating. Well, reading, reading God's word and 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 your belief in um, uh, Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us to make us clean. I think it's something inward that you can't control somehow because. Um, you don't have to know much about the Bible, actually, to believe, I think. I think it could occur. And, and you could not have any teaching at all. And that's why I tried to learn in 12 years at what I didn't know. The repentance that comes about, the, the sorrow over my sin, comes about by the preaching of the law mm -hmm. that reveals my sin to me. Remember okay. the mirror? Yes, I was just going to say, you have to recognize that you are a sinful individual. And the yes. Old Testament believers had that same mirror of God's law mm -hmm. in what Moses had laid down, and he got it from God. Ten Commandments. And also, they had forgiveness preached to them. Forgiveness is not a foreign concept in the Old Testament. It's all over the place. And Christ is there if you but just look for it, for him. Mm -hmm. So the same thing happened when the, the word was preached. Some repented. So they took to heart the Lord's charge against their speaking against him. Okay. And number two, what was the evidence of their repentance? Judy has already said they stopped bringing uh, diseased and imperfect animals for the sacrifice. Those who feared the Lord 
spoke with one another and esteemed his name. This is what we do uh, when we challenge and comfort one another with the word of God. This speaking is not just talking about uh, the new car someone bought or the fact that um, a member of our congregation has, uh, has had to move to another place to get a different job. That's not the speaking we're talking about over a cup of coffee. We're speaking about, they're speaking about the Lord's work in their lives. Those who feared the Lord esteemed his name. Hmm. They held it high. Instead of speaking against him, they are not now speaking for him. Mm-hmm. And there's the evidence. They wouldn't have, they weren't esteeming his name before, but now they are. The Lord heard and knew their repentance was real. You can't fake re- repentance before God. You might be able, uh, Ian, I'll use you for an example if you don't mind. You might be able to fake repentance before your dad or your mom. And uh, uh, when our children were young, I uh, I knew how they said it. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, you teach children to say thank you before they are really thankful. You teach people table manners before they really need it so that when they go out in public, they don't embarrass you. Now, that's a poor motivation, I know. But you can't fake repentance before the Lord. You can't pretend that you're sorry. Mm-hmm. He knows your heart. Uh, you know, I can I can fool some of the people all the time. <laughs> I don't think I can feel fool all the people some of the time. But I can't fool the Lord. Um, people have written articles and books and devotions around this theme. Um, he knows. God knows. What is this book of remembrance? Any guesses? Book of life. Book of life. Book of life. Yeah. 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 God has a scroll. And we look in Revelation 20, verse 12, and find out that there is a book of life. He writes names there, and he knows their hearts. And God will not forget them. Let's change the pronouns. He knows our hearts, and he will not forget us. The Lord knows. The fact that the Lord knows can be a threat to us. But it also can be a comfort to us, because the Lord knows how you struggle against sins of weakness, sins of malice, sins of which you have forgotten, and they are many, sins you were never aware of committing. But he has also brought you to repentance as you come face to face with this accusing law. The reason we have a general confession in our worship service is because we don't have time or the memory to list all of our sins. But we have sinned against them him by by what? Thought, word, and deed. And does that cover it? That's the summary, isn't it? I remember is, that as my Girl Scout creed. Thought, word, and deed. Really? The Lord, yes. I didn't know it was in there. Yes. Hmm. Thought, word, and deed. You had to. Um, how is it going? I forgot how it said. I, I can't remember it right now, but. Okay. God has spoken forgiveness to you. And he's going to keep on doing that. One of the reasons that pastors want their people in the worship service is so that he can speak that forgiveness to you. The forgiveness that you have is earned through the blood his son Jesus shed for you. That message is the gospel. 
and we're going to preach it until he comes again. The Lord also knows your heart, for he has spoken faith into your heart. Do you believe that God has forgiven all your sin? All? Yes. Yes. There's no sin that remains against you? No. Not no. one. And God will not forget you. It may seem like it now and then when you suffer an illness, uh, when someone dies. But God never forgets you. He loves you with an everlasting love, and that will not cease. You belong to him for now and for eternity. He will not break that. So he invites you to trust him for the outcome, whatever the struggle, no matter how many people seem to be getting away with it. Do not ever take that as a way of joining them in their sins. That's not the outcome God wants for us. You have struggled. You have lived long enough, except for Ian. <laughs> In you are learning more and more through the struggles that you will endure. Pain and suffering is coming to you. Ask your elders about that. Ask your grandpa about it. The struggles they've gone through, they don't want to rehearse all of them. But they will tell you about some of them. I didn't like being young. I didn't like being told that someday, 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 I wanted to get on with life and get to that someday. Well, one day at a time, we all did, right? And we're still here and we're still his. You understand what I'm saying to you? It's all gospel. So what were, the, what were the Lord's promises? They shall be mine. I will spare them. I will judge the evildoers. Ian, you haven't read today, would you? Read Malachi 4.1. Still with us? Uh, I don't see... Well, I was talking about him, and then he left. I, I don't. I didn't think I caused that. No. Um, okay. Maybe he had to see eleven o'clock. Maybe he had another commitment. That that happened last week. Jeannie, can I ask you to read? No, she's muted. Back to Jamie. All right. Four one. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. What is that about? Judgment day, it sounds like. It is coming. Now, that's uh, over 400 years before Christ, 2,400 years before now, and the day hasn't come yet. Sounds like they're also talking about hell in there, mm -hmm. if you don't, don't go to heaven. Yeah. Neither root nor branch. Well, it, sound, it, it sounds like for those that don't believe or don't uh, evil doers. Don't ask for forgiveness. The the word evildoers is used pretty much for those that for those who are not God's people because they have yeah. refused His offer. God followers. There's no no grace. All right. Some things to think and pray about. If the Lord would return today, would you be afraid to face Him? 
Hmm. Whatever is, is. Would you be afraid to face God if he, if he re would return before you went to bed tonight? No. If you're ever afraid, tell him that. And then realize how many promises he has given you. How many times Jesus said, fear not. Look it up. Are there people you know who are not ready to meet the Lord? How is God ever going to speak Malachi's warnings and promises to them? How's that ever going to happen? We have to tell people. We have to spread the gospel. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's been commissioned to us to do, as Jamie said, to do the work of the Lord and share, share the light. If you can't drag them kicking and screaming into the sanctuary, we have to pray for them. Um, Certainly. It's a big thing. Keep them in your prayers. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, even that talk we would like to have just can't, can't, it doesn't seem like it can take place without uh, um, our argumentative uh, conversation. Well, the way around that, as I may have mentioned, is, is to speak of your own faith. Correct. Just, this is what God has done for me and what he means to me. And when they say, when they say, but, 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 mm -hmm. just say, well, put away your butts for a minute. <laughs> put away your objections for a minute and just listen to what I'm saying about how he has helped me. See, they can't deny that. Are there some sins that people are afraid to confess? Yes. I'm sure there are. Are there people that say, I, I'm sure that my sins will ever prevent me from going to heaven. Yes. Yeah. It's not true. There, well, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I, I think sometimes there are even those that have belief, but, you know, we falter sometimes and we have that hesitancy thinking that there is something in our past life or something we've done that might um, deny us heaven. What can the congregation leaders do to make it easier for you to bring the message of warning and promise to people like them? That's a big open question, and I don't expect you to answer it fully today, but I wanted to bring it before you. And if you have ideas, uh, don't be afraid to voice them to me or Pastor Vince or the elders or the other leaders, board of directors, whatever. I, I think um, it's not known or it's not, it's not, I mean, that Jesus will forgive your sins. I mean, if that was more of the credo, um, it might catch more people than you're going to go to hell or whatever else they say. Um, I've not heard many outside preachers, but one time in um, uh, FAU, there was a man outside. I happened to, it's really funny, but I won't get into that. Um, but that's what he was preaching. And the kids were wondering if he was even a false, not that Jesus will forgive your sins, but the way he was going on was, what I know he meant well, but it was like turning them off. And, and I think, the, the sin part is what can get people because we're all sinners, you know, even, and, and everyone knows it a little bit, you know, even if they want to hide it, they do know it. Okay. You're, you're on, you're on the right track and something that I we can talk about more fully at another time. Judy. I, I was going to say, I think, you know, I, I've heard our pastors even say that they always make sure that uh, if law is shared, you know, um, 
fire, the fire and brimstone. And I can remember as a child, it was all, it was much more fire and brimstone coming from our own synod. And this is back 70 some years ago. Then now to make sure we always end with gospel or gospel is being shared. Uh, yeah, uh, the right. hope uh, in our, you know, the hope of Jesus Christ in our church. I also like personal testimonies. I think personal testimonies really speak a lot to people um, because you really relate to them. Um, not only just coming from the pastor, but from congregational members when um, some of them uh, certainly gave um, the Lenten services this year. It was, um, it was really uh, enlightening to hear, their, hear them share their faith. But it Judy, that's too much time. People don't listen that long anymore. Like you're in church, you're captive. But out there, you know, you need, a, you need to catch them uh, with, you know, do you want your sins forgiven or something like that? Well, I know pastors doing the one minute message on Facebook, I believe, and YouTube, you know, yeah. trying to catch people with a summary, short summary of this, of the sermon. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes you do have to do it like an advertisement that catches you on TV. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have, do we have to share the word that way in a catchy phrase? I don't know. There are many channels, but one message. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that um, I am uh, awkwardly going to end this in the middle, but our time has really slipped away quickly. And I've, I want to thank you for sharing so much today. That's, as, that's, that's valuable and it makes it personal because the people who are watching later they have the benefit of reflection. Uh, they can even put it on pause and think about it. So I ask you who are listening to um, be with us in this prayer that we ask now the Lord's help. Uh, you have been merciful to us, O Lord, in so many ways. You have given us all that we need for this body and this life. But more than that, you have given us your son into death for our sins and you have opened our mouth to confess your name in the great congregation now we ask for courage and content both courage and content to say what is necessary to those we know and love and also the, to the stranger in the gate that there is a god who loves you with an infinite love and that he has decided in his grace to forgive all your sins for the sake of the blood that Jesus, your son, has shed for us all, for us all, for even you, and to us, to ourselves and to all sinners everywhere, we say Jesus Christ is for you. He's the one. Take him at his word. Hear us pray, O Lord as we do always, and ask your blessing and on our studies and our faith in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said what? Amen. Amen.